So you prefer solutions to existent problems. So before we go into what President Mahama seeks to do for the Ghanaian people, we must understand the problems of the country. Right, quickly, let me tackle this before I come to that. You spoke about corruption. MPP's full manifesto had 216 pages. Out of 216 pages I have read, corruption was mentioned only three times. Three times. One, two, three. Out of 216 pages, corruption was mentioned three times in their manifesto. And that was it. The simple reason is that even the, draft, the drafters of the manifesto have been soiled with gruesome corruption. Those who drafted that manifesto have been soiled with gargantuan corruption. And those who displayed the manifesto at that campaign launch have also been soiled with, with gross and gargantuan corruption. And so any attempt of them writing corruption in their manifesto, their own conscience virtually fought them. It's just as if you are a thief, and then you come and stand on a platform, and you want to insult thieves. At a point, when we look at your face, we will know that this true we during the space i would give you a list and explain into details so people understand the kind of harm this this particular corrupt government have done to us i spoke about where we are in the crisis we find ourselves in as young people one of our topmost priority are jobs one of our topmost priority are jobs you go to school for 18 years you pay school fees for 18 years nobody helps you if you don't pay your fees they suck you if you don't pay your fees, you are embarrassed. How to even get those monies to pay the fees sometimes is a problem. And after 18 years in school, you graduate and complete university at an average age of 22 years. When you finish, the government tells you that there are no jobs for you. If there are no jobs for us, then why did we go to school? Because our forefathers didn't go to school, yet they lived on this earth. So if we go to school and after finishing school and pay money to government to survive, the money that we're supposed to use to be used to create jobs for us to work in when we complete schools, when we finish, you tell us there are no jobs. Then there is no need taking the school fees. Because mind you, all the huge sums of school fees we pay to the government, part of it is supposed to be used to create avenues for employment for us so that when we finish school, we get a place to work because government pays already for the tuition of senior high school. That was done in the Akosombo Accord somewhere in 1994. So where they said that monies from the Akosombo fund would be used to subvent or supplement our paying of school fees. If those of you who have read history or those of you who were part of student politics, you remember that Nook somewhere in 1994-1996 fought government to just to implement that Akosombo Accord. And government finally agreed that they would take away tuition so that we could pay for the little, little tariffs that were left. In fact, at the point, Nooks attempted action government to pay for even utility. And that has been a bone of contention till now. So the government virtually pays for tuition for all students. The other things we pay for are the academic user fee, the facility user fees, and the little, little things. So if you cost all those things, there's supposed to be a huge surplus that government is supposed to use to create avenues of employment for us so that when we finish these schools, we can find avenues to also work. Today, the unemployment rate in this country, we all know, is around 14.7%. The NDC left it at 7%. When NDC was leaving office, virtually 800,000 people were unemployed in this economy. Today, you have 1.8 million Ghanaian youth who don't have anything to do. I am not adding the people who are working, but their jobs are nothing to write home about. I'm only speaking about people you ask, do you have a job? And the person says, no, I don't have a job. 1.8 million. If you look at the number, the first question you ask yourself is, what happens to all the monies government have been taking? And what, happened, what has happened to all the investments that government is supposed to be putting up for we, the Ghanaian youth, to get jobs to do? When NDC was leaving office, the only money President Mahama borrowed throughout his term of office as president was 44 billion. 44 billion. With that 44 billion, 
what President Mahama sought to do was to invest in what we call capital expenditure. Those capital investments at the buildings were all seen around because, of course, but for the recent, I mean, involvement of the IT world where people are able to do businesses online. And even with that, you will still need a structure where you are able to work in or a facility you are able to coordinate from. There is no online business that does not have a certain structure that we work from even microsoft and the people who invented twitter or x today and facebook and what have you all have facilities abroad that if you are looking for an x office you can walk to if you are looking for a microsoft office you can walk to why is it that they don't put their offices online so that we work it's because all it systems still need facilities and building to coordinate all the activities they are building upon and so President Mahama was setting up all these capital investments so that when we graduate, we can all get jobs to do. What are some of those jobs? President Mahama thought that, look, every year you have nurses and doctors graduating. So when those nurses and doctors graduate, we don't need to work in hospitals. Where are the hospitals? We have people who are sick. At the time, the, the doctor-patient ratio was about 40, 40, no, 4,000 patients to a doctor. Was about 4,000 patients to a doctor. And how can a doctor take care of 4,000 patients? It wasn't because at the time we didn't have enough doctors, but the facilities to which the doctors would be working from were not available. And healthcare is such that even if you have two hospitals within one vicinity, those hospitals will always be choked. Because every now and then, because we eat and we drink and we work, we definitely experience what we call wear and tear. And when wear and tear sets in, we'll go to the hospital for medical care. So President Mama said, I would invest in health, in, health, in, in health facilities. So that capital expenditure will be able to take us through generations upon generations. It will provide jobs for nurses, it will provide jobs for doctors, and it will cure people who are sick and will go to the hospitals. Not only that, you see, whenever we hear of a hospital, the only thing we usually think about is that, look, this is supposed to create jobs for nurses or this is supposed to create jobs for doctors. But remember that every hospital has an accounting department that will create jobs for accountants. Remember that every hospital has an administration that will create jobs for administrators. So people who have done public administration at the university level will get jobs at the administration department. When you go to a hospital and you visit the administration, you don't find doctors there. All you find are administrators who are compiling the documents and keeping records and taking stocks of all inventory. Every hospital will require a security man. So even the informal sector, brothers and sisters who have not been to school, will be able to work at the informal sectors. Every hospital also requires cleaners. In fact, one of the topmost employment in hospitals are not even nurses, are cleaners. Because hospital is a place that people come there, and for all of you who are eating, I'm very, very sorry, many apologies to you. People come and vomit. People come and then, I mean, discharge all sorts of fluids. And for many of you who have been to the hospital, you realize that when you go to a hospital and it's even dirty, the next time you don't want to go there. The cleaners are always working every second, every day, every minute. When you are in the, on the bed, they will come and clean. They clean the pavements, they clean the way roads and all of that. In fact, a hospital is supposed to be a serene environment where we could experience good hygiene and good health. So if they keep the hospital dirty, then it means that we are rather sick and coming to the hospital to fall sick again because the hygiene is very poor. So it employs many cleaners and our brothers and sisters who haven't been to school could have gotten jobs to do. Every hospital has a stock keeping department. And for all of you who have learned data entry and what have you, especially the IT gurus, when you go to the hospital, you find people behind the computers, key in data and key in stocks. All these people are not doctors or nurses. They are IT persons. So people who have studied ICT in school, you'll be able to get jobs there. So just sit down and imagine the kind of capital investment President Mahama made in only the health sector. So you can talk of the University of Ghana Medical Center. Many of you who have been there, the last time Wadimaya went there and took a picture, the, at the first glance of the picture, I thought he was standing at the United States of America. He later said, many of you would think this is America, but this is in Ghana. That was the capital investment President Mahama made. President Mahama built the Bank of Ghana Hospital. Many of you today go there for medical health care. In fact, during COVID, the ministers who were saying we don't eat houses and we don't eat capital investments were the first to go and lie there. But for that hospital, the health minister himself would have been dead and gone. By now, he would have become a skeleton in his, in his casket. But he sought health care there and was treated. Many other ministers 
were rushed to the University of Ghana, to sorry, the Bank of Ghana Hospital, even the University of Ghana Medical Center. The Tamale Teaching Hospital was expanded. I was born in Tamale. In those days, if your sickness goes beyond diarrhea, they will refer you to Konfuanoche. If your sickness goes beyond headache, they will, respect, they will refer you to Kolebu, simply because we did not have machines. I remember there was a year that they didn't even have an oxygen machine at the Tamale Teaching Hospital. The whole teaching hospital didn't have an oxygen machine. So if you come there and at the point you cannot breathe, excuse me to say, you have to look for volunteers to be pumping air into you per second until your breath finally comes back. And I mean, it was it was very, very tiring. President Mama said, those things must be a thing of the past. He expanded it. We ha he now had a, a, a cardio center. He had two ambulances, new ambulances. He had an oxygen plant, a new x-ray department so many facilities were brought on board and today before they refer you from tamale to to kolebu teaching hospital it means that even kolebu may not be able to treat you because tamale if tamale cannot treat you then kolebu cannot treat you in, in this country and all these investments were done by president Muhammad. the rich hospital was expanded for many of you, sometimes we forget. But for many of you who knew the Rich Hospital by then, the Rich Hospital just looked like Kalijay's kitchen cabinet. It was something small where Kalijay has been cooking a lot of these corrupt appointees. Very small and very tiny. And when you go to the Rich Hospital during those days, I mean, it was very, very embarrassing to, 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 to point at this hospital and say, this is the Rich Hospital of Ghana. Very, very, very sad. But President Mama came and said, no, this is not uh, Kalijay's uh, cooking uh, cabinet. And a hospital is not a place for chefs like Kalijay. So we must expand it and, and make it a whole facility where people could seek medical attention. If you want food to eat, you can go to a kitchen. But this place is supposed to treat people. The whole hospital was virtually like a chop bar. But President Mama expanded it. Today, when you go to the rich hospital, you, you are proud to say that this is a Ghanaian hospital. And that is, those were some of the things President Mama used 44 billion to do. The Tamale, and I've already spoken about the Tamale, the Bogatanga Hospital, Siwa Hospital, Agogo Hospital, and then five new hospitals President Mama brought. Today, I've seen that the fraud have, attempt, have attempted stealing those, those projects when they didn't even know where the money came from. I remember when President Mama went to Brazil and uh, he was lobbying for the money from the Rafacian Bank of Vienna, about 83 million euros, yeah, euros at a time, to set up five hospitals, one at Somenia, one at Tolong, 65 bed, no, 75 bed capacity at Bipe, 75 bed capacity at Sola, and then a 35 bed polyclinic at Bamboy. Five hospitals, President Mama brought it, and then the contract was, was awarded. They went into action and then they constructed those hospitals. Those days, we those from the north, we know how the Bipe Tamale Road is usually exposed to accidents. Those days when you have an accident on those roads, before they get you to the hospitals, you may have been dead because there was no hospital there. President Mama thought that no, we must have a hospital where if people get accidents, of those, we don't pray people get accidents, but they are sometimes inevitable. When people get accidents, they could quickly be the chip compounds scattered all across the country. But President Mama has left the chip compounds as achievements to MP, unlike uh, Alaji Baumia, who will even go and fight with market women for an achievement of donating a poly tank to their markets. And when you read their tracker, when he donated a poly tank to the solar hospital, it was part of it. In fact, the last time they constructed a speed ramp at solar, they added it to their tracker. Oi, la, 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 la. So that aside, those are hospitals. Then we come to the capital investments in education, the education sector. Schools, 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 schools are major capital investments. They don't just create jobs, but they equip the youth of this country for a better tomorrow. I'm Malik Basentali because I've been to school. All of you are who you are because you've been to school. And even those who have not been to school aspire or wish that they had also gone to school because at the end of the day, they're able to get themselves abreast with modern technology and modern knowledge. President Mama thought that we're lacking behind. Schools were getting choked here and there. Let me see my hands. some Prempe College students here. I'm a product of Prempe College. I'm an amount for, I'm a senior. And so some of us, those days, you see how the schools were choked and were packed and all of that. President Mama said, no, let me copy the system of China or the United States. For those of you who have been to China, in China, we do we experience what we call the community day school. If you live at East Legon, 
you cannot attend the school at Juru in China. It is prohibited. And the Chinese law have stated that you cannot cross your route to attend school somewhere. It is prohibited. So the Chinese government, somebody, somebody's phone is, is interrupting. If you can mute it. The Chinese government have set the system in such a way that if you school beyond your community, then you'll be ready to cater for the child, the education of your child. But if you allow your child to attend school within your community, then the government will pay the fees for you. But the Chinese government didn't just do that. Ex I mean, monitoring the inequality or inefficiencies of some of the schools within the communities. What they did was to improve upon the schools within their communities. And that's why President Mama said, look, a community like Tolong should get the same school as a community like Pabenya. A community in Brekum should get the same school as a school community in, in Tema. And so that we would have equalization and the child in Brekum will not aspire to come to a school in Tema. That child will stay in Brekum and attend the community day school. So that was the intention of the community day schools. And at least before NDC left office, um, we built about 53 of them. There, so many of them were still under construction, but monies were fully made available. The loan, part of it was from the African Development Bank, part of it was from the World Bank, and part of it was financed by the government of Ghana. And the monies were readily available, and the projects had commenced. Many had even been completed. So those days in 2016, when President Mama was cutting sword, many people called him the infrastructural god, the infrastructural king, the commissioner general. He was proud of it. But I mean, his pride came from the fact that he did not misuse the monies of the Ghanaian people. He invested it in capital expenditure, and some of it was schools. When we build schools, what that also does for us is that it doesn't just recruit teachers. It recruits security men. It recruits cleaners. It recruits administrators. Again, here, so many of you who also study public administration, not just the hospitals, but you get to work in these schools. And all of you who've attended schools, you always have what we call the accounts department. That accounts department recruits accountants and financial experts. So the schools will recruit teachers, they recruit cleaners, they recruit security men, they recruit pantry men, especially, especially, especially pantry men and cooks. My mother is a matron. And so these schools recruited cooks cooks and chefs, chefs like Aliji, he recruited them to be to be cooking food in the kitchen. And those days, uh, one of the very enviable uh, portfolios everyone wished to hold was the dining hall prefect. Because for you, your chop box will be filled with milk and leftover bull fruit after every dining session. But, I mean, the most important is that recruited chefs, recruited cooks. You could imagine a number of caterers that these are school senior high schools recruited who are cooking for us the pantry boys and all of that that is what the schools do to us so that is another capital investment that created jobs so if anybody saw that unemployment was relatively stable under president mahama at an average of seven percent it was simply because he invested in capital expenditure and these investments were recruiting the Ghanaian youth and not people from Saudi Arabia. They were recruiting Ghanaians and Ghanaians were getting jobs under President Mahama. Again, was the where the airports President Mahama built. President Mahama could have simply said that, look, the monies I was getting, I'll use it to go and chop my mouth or I'll use it to go and watch a UEFA Champions League finals at Madrid between Liverpool and Tottenham like Agufuado did. But President Mahama said, instead of spending £14,000, I'd rather pay my DSTV for 200 Ghana City and sit in my room and i watch the finals when i finish i'll drink water and sleep it is better than wasting over five million ghana city of the taxpayers money to go and do this to go and watch the finals and you you president Akufado, even if you are watching and people stand up you may not be able to see because you are you are you are you are my height mate so why would you sit in the room where you can have the leverage of looking at your tv and watching you want to go to stadium and watch match. you can you see the back so that on a lighter note, you spent over 5 million Ghana cities touring the country and watching these football matches. It brought nothing to the people of this country. President Mama thought that, no, let me invest in airports. So he built the Terminal 3 today. And anybody who has gone to the airport, whether to travel or to, um, I mean, see a visitor of, or to welcome a visitor, please look at the number of people who work at the airport. Anytime you get to the Terminal 3, ask yourself, if this facility were not here, where will all these people have been working? Just ask yourself that question. If Terminal 3, the airport were not available, where will all those people who are working there be working today, including Paul Adomotre, who is now the board chairman of the airport today? Where will he have been working? He would have virtually remained on TV and doing the exercises doing that. But because of the investments of President Mahama, 
more than 3,000 Ghanaians have direct jobs. More than 5,000 have indirect jobs at the airport today. And every now and then you go, it is busy and it is working and it is generating revenue for the economy of this country. That was vision. As a mama thought of expanding the Tamale teaching hospital and that company again mpp the frauds have attempted stealing it president mama awarded it to a company called Quires galvao they started constructing that hospital in tamale and they did it in 2016 if some of you remembered president mama escorted the first batch of Hajj pilgrims from the tamale airport they flew straight to mecca under the watch of a visionary president so i'm just giving you all these states so that you understand what president mahama did for this country so that anytime you hear some of these corrupt entities and these fraudsters uh, uh, in mpp colors trying to denigrate the projects of president mahama you will tell them that no please this is what president mahama did for the economy of this country you can state many of some of the things i've stated i've not gone into the electricity sector of how he resolved doom so of course doom so was headache to all of us me to be honest let me confess to all of you at a point in time one of my saddest moments was was coming home back at night and seeing my lights off and i kept asking myself why can't you fix this why can't you fix this until one day president mahama mounted the podium and said that i have you at heart i have found the solution to this problem this problem started under president kofo and when president kofo was in office they didn't add a single megawatt of of power to our energy corridor in this country but i will solve it what i'll do is to bring power batches so president mama brought a merry power batch power batches are simply big let me explain it in the layman's language so you understand a power batch is a big power bank good let me use a power bank so it's a big power bank a big power bank with some percentage some number of a megawatt so if you take your power bank sometimes you will see 2000 ah or uh, or 1000 mah or uh, 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 10,000. That is the capacity of the power bank. So a power batch is the big power bank that is supposed to generate electricity to the people of this can of a country. So if our power banks are being charged by electricity and they provide electricity to us. But these power batches are not charged by electricity. What they are charged by are gas or crude. So you either put crude in it or you supply it with gas and then it generates enough power to beef up your electricity shortfall. So at the time, the total consumption of electricity in this country was um, during peak seasons in 2016, we did paltry about 2,800 megawatts. But the available capacity at the time, if you add all our power generation systems in this country, we we're doing just above 1,200. So it admittedly, there was a shortfall of about 1,600 power uh, megawatts that we needed to add on to our electricity generation capacity. So President Mama said, look, Dumso is not a spiritual problem. During, in 2007, when Dumso came, MPP went and brought pastors, pastors from Suhum, Apedra, and community tem uh, Tema Community 1. They carried these pastors to the Akosombo Dam. The news item is online. If somebody has it, you can drop it in the comment section. They carried them to Akosombo. I remember that day, one of the pastors put their hand on the Akosombo Dam. Hey, ba 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 ba. Hey, ba 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 ba. Kabosh, kabele, bele, bele, bele. Whatever. Oh, my brother. They tracked all sorts of tons in, in the world on the Akosombo Dam. Not even a single megawatt of power was added to our electricity generation. After all the tongues and fasting, prayers and whatever, not a single megawatt. The people of this country were still under Dumso. So President Mama said, look, Dumso is not a spiritual problem. It is not caused by witches and, and, and gyms and midgets and, and dwarfs. Dumso is caused by a shortfall in, electri in electricity generation. So if you want to solve them, so you must beef up our electricity generation. And President Mama thought that the only way we could beef up, of course, we already had a hydro system, Akosombo Dam, coming on board. Akosombo was supposed to generate over 1,200 to 1,500 megawatts of power. But you know, hydro, uh, hydro is a form of generating power. I want to explain. Hydro is generating power using water. That is not stable because with that, you cannot determine the amount of electricity, uh, I mean, power, water can generate at a particular point in time and due to nature sometimes the water goes below level sometimes the water comes above level so you cannot really determine how much megawatts it's able to generate for you so president mama said look by in view of this we cannot rely on hydro 
we already have Akosombo, we have the Bui Dam, but we cannot rely on them. So we must have immediate solutions to that power generation in this country. And so President Mama thought that the solution to that was to bring power batches. So he brought Ameri, that brought on board 250 megawatts. He brought car power, that brought on board 250 megawatts again. And then we had other little power batches. So we contracted what we call the IPPs. Those are independent power producers. They are private individuals who have set up their power generation plants in this country to support. So we have what we call Sanan Asogle. That is, uh, I think, belongs to Togbe Afede. It's, it's, it also generates some amount of, 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 of power. Then we have the Sen Power. Uh, that's from SNET. That also generates some megawatts of power. Then we have TAP2, uh, uh, the Tema Power, power Plant, uh, TT, TT Plant, uh, TT, TTPP. I think it's called TTPP. That's the Tema Power Plant. Then there's one at Takrade, the Takrade Power Plant. And uh, so these were other power batches that were added on to what we had already brought. And then our electricity generation rose from the 1,200 to about 4,800 megawatts of power. So how can somebody increase our generation from 1,200 to 4,800? And you tell the person he didn't solve them. So when our peak demand at the time was 2,800. So obviously the person solved them. So and even left a reserve of energy. Now, I've heard MPB people say that the reserve was excess power and we've been paying for it. Ignore those frauds again. They are lying. If you take the ECG contract, ECG determines that at every particular point in time, we must have a reserve of power. So your total energy generation in this country. So we have three things. We have total power. We have available uh, capacity. We have total uh, total capacity. We have uh, and we have the available capacity. The available capacity is what is always readily available to use. So the fact that your car tank can take 1,200 Ghana CD fuel to fill it does not necessarily mean that when you put 600 Ghana CD fuel in it, you will not move. So the total capacity of your car indeed is 1,200 Ghana CD fuel. But you can decide to put 600 Ghana CD fuel and still run it. So if you put 600 Ghana CD fuel, it means that you are running at half capacity. But that half capacity now becomes the available capacity that you can use in running your power batches. So the excess based on ECG should be about 13 to 50, 15% of your total generation. So that at every point in time, if one of the power batch even goes off, you won't have the people of this country going into doom. So you only have to migrate all of them to another corridor. So they'll be able to get energy and then to use in this country. So that was a surplus that was set aside by President Mahama. And again, all research that were conducted estimated that by 2028 our generation capacity in this country will rise to about 5,000 because all of you on this space here today are building houses all of you would one day build your houses all of you today many people today use air conditions many people today use um, refrigerators many people today use even about three tvs in their houses many, so the, it means that our demand for energy will continue to rise and to rise so why is it that we will not have enough power readily available so that when the demand increases, we will still have power. Then to wait for the demand to increase, then we go into doom so again. Then we start crying, doom so, doom so, doom so, and looking for power batches. So President Mama was visionary. He brought in more so that we could save it. And then when demand rises, we could use it as, as a system in this country. So that was how the NDC resolved doom so in this country i'll leave what the ndc did i mean after all these things you all know that ndc like i said was previewed to 44 billion in in in, in loans we are taking the ndc government was availed to only two oil fields and then in fact by the time the third one came the mpp government was estimated to have about three billion annually in it all the taxes we had brought esla and the rest we never benefited from them because we left power in 2016 so esla started bringing in about three billion annually in 2017 and and together with all the things we are left by the time president mama left office he fund about 250 million again for the MPP government, together with all the other tax corridors like uh, ESLA, uh, the GET Fund, and all those funds that were accruing monies to the government of Ghana. And that was where President Mama left. Now, when President Mama was leaving office, the construction rate in this country was about 8.4%. That was because of the good job President Mama had done. Electricity access, electricity access in this country that increased by 4%, so the total of 83.5%. 
of people in this country had access to electricity under President Mahama. When President Mahama was leaving office, the manufacturing sector had grown by 7.9%. Uh, the currency, the dollar, of course, you all know the dollar rate at the time was about 4 CD, uh, 20 pesos to a dollar. In fact, the Bank of Ghana even says it was 4 CD, but I, for the benefit of the doubt, I just want to leave it at uh, 4 CD, 20 pesos. The private sector was growing by 14.4% when President Mama was leaving office. The financial and insurance sector was growing by 8% when President Mama was leaving office. Now, let me tell you where we are today as a government. Today, the construction sector that was growing by 8.4% under President Mama is currently growing by negative 8.4%. Negative, not positive, negative. So, the construction sector has declined to 0% and has now gone into negative. And in the negative, it is at 8.5%. So, it is a senior in the negatives of, of, of the construction sector under Akufado. And the manufacturing sector that was doing 7.9% under President Mahama, today, just when they read their budget, is growing by negative 1.1%. So, it has hit zero. It is now at negative 1.1%. So, as for the negative sector, the manufacturing sector is still a junior because the construction sector is, uh, is still a senior uh, than it in, in, in that sector. The private sector that was doing 14.4% today is running at 1%. The growth rate is 1%. The financial and insurance sector, and of course, they've collapsed all the banks. So, you can expect your financial and insurance sector to grow. And let me explain the banking sector cleanup. The banking sector cleanup could have been resolved by a paltry $5 billion. But this government decided to waste 25 billion and yet have rendered people unemployed, have collapsed banks, and have dwindled a lot of people's investments. How many people have watched Dr. Indum traveling around the country and then uh, uh, virtually in tears with videos? He looks at his properties and, and he wants to cry. Sometimes I remember how he campaigned against President Mahama, but other times I'm a compassionate human being and I feel that if he were my father, I will not be happy seeing how a government have recklessly, I mean, condemned all these investments. And I would really, really weep. So I see, I try to forget his attack on President Mahama and rather to look at the amounts of money and investments he has lost as a result of this cruel and very wicked Akufuado Baumia government. The financial sector simply needed what we call the discount window. Some of you are financial people know what we call the discount window. The discount window. Uh, money is made available by the Bank of Ghana so that when companies go below their threshold they should meet, they support them with those monies to be able to survive until their monies are paid back. So remember that many banks give out loans. And when banks give you loans, they don't expect you to pay within a day. Some of the loans are to be paid back within one year, some of them six months, some of them two years. So when Akufuado came, they asked that the banks should increase their threshold from the 85 million to about 410 million. And the bank said, look, you have come. You have asked us to increase our threshold. The threshold means that they should always have those monies at the bank in their accounts to prove that they are indeed financially equipped to cater for bad debts, days or bad debts. So the Bank of Ghana said, the 800, about 80 million threshold you used to keep, you are increasing to 400 million. And we are giving you just three weeks to get it. Then the bank said, oh, we've given Ghanaians loans. In fact, some of the Ghanaians have even done contracts for you, government of Ghana, true contracts. Some of them are contractors. You haven't paid them. So if you haven't paid them, how do they pay our monies back so that we're able to meet the threshold? So we are begging you, allow us some space so that we'll be able to make up for some of these losses. When we retrieve our monies, then we'll meet the threshold. After the threshold, is not a problem. But we've given monies out to people. So hold on. Hey, hey. because their Ejapadia documents had said that, they must collapse all banks and give only data bank the, the strength in this country. They decided to go ahead. They collapsed almost all the banks in this country and left only a few ones. Today, a lot of the banks you see today are multinational. So they are banks that quickly went to their international companies to come and beef up their thresholds in this country. Other than that, they would have also collapsed. But the local banks don't have any father or mother outside Ghana. They rely on the investments from Ghana. So they didn't have anybody to rely on. And that was how come the banks had to be collapsed, all because they wanted Data Bank, which is a bank of President Akufuado's uh, nephew, Ken Furata, to stand on his feet. They collapsed all these banks with 25 million. They pretended as if they were paying people, yet you rendered more than 5,000 to 10,000 Ghanaians unemployed. All the people who were working in these banks today have become, some have become Uber drivers, some have become Okada riders, some are just in the house, some don't even know what to do with their lives. In fact, I will not be surprised, some have even committed. I mean, uh, a suicide, and some have lost their lives because of the pain they, they were asked to go through within all these years. And they just left those 
uh, people to their fates and abandoned all those financial sectors. So as a result, the financial sector is growing in negative. The private sector, like I said, under us was growing about 14.4%. Today, the private sector is also growing at 1%, very, very low. And so all the sectors under this economy are growing negative. Unemployment today is about 14.4%. A bag of rice today sells at about 600 Ghana cities. A bag of corn goes for close to 1,000 Ghana cities. A bag of cement today goes for about 105 Ghana cities. A ton of iron rods today goes for about 12,000 Ghana cities. Under NDC, a ton of iron rods was just 1,500. Today is about 12,000 Ghana cities. Under NDC, those days we used to compare a bag of cement to the price of pizza if you remember a bag of cement was 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 selling at about 20 ghana cities before ndc left office to the bag of cement is about 105 ghana cities so for some of you who haven't built houses and you are part to build houses in fact you need to be to, to be ready and to know that <laughs> It will not be easy setting up putting up a house because you have to buy many bags of cement. And I'm wondering where we are going to get those monies to buy all those things. So that is the economy of the country today. Now, the government comes to tell you and I that we should forgive them. We should forgive them their trespasses and give them another leaf. There are two things we must ask the government. Baumia says he wasn't in charge, and that is why he wants to be president. Baumia must tell us two things. One is either Baumia confesses to us that for the eight years of being a vice president he was entirely useless and by being useless it was because akufado didn't give him the mandate to work so he was a useless vice president or he should take responsibility for things he has done these are two things you cannot be hot and cold at the same time you must either choose to be hot or you must choose to be cold on one breath you come and tell us that as vice president i did this i did that i did this and so when you vote for me i will do more on another breath, he comes and says, oh, me, dear, I wasn't in charge. So, and now, when you make me president, I'll be in charge. It's either you were useless or you were incapable when you were given the nod. That Baumia has to substantiate. And then after he does that, we we'll then take a decision on whether we we'll we'll even give him an ear or won't give him an ear. Now, the reason why in 2016, the late Emi Sata was telling Baumia that, you cannot use textbooks economics to run the country. He was saying so because, let me give you an example. For those of you who have done economics, when you read economic textbook, it tells you that when supply exceeds demand and there is a surplus of commodities supplied, what the businessman does is to increase prices of goods. When he does that, indeed, the price will come down and they need to meet an equilibrium. When that equilibrium is reached, then he can then say that demand and supply are at same point. But the reality is that when things are rather many in the market, or when you, you, you have a lot of supply of commodities in the market, it becomes so, it becomes in abundance. And when commodities are in abundance, the businesswoman will rather reduce the price of the commodity so people can buy. Nobody increases the price when supply is exceeds demand. No, in reality, nobody does that. When I have many tomatoes, I'm selling. And then Kalijay has many tomatoes. And then Berry has many tomatoes. And then Adele has many tomatoes. And DZ and Trumacy have many tomatoes. When somebody comes to buy, I would have to reduce my price so that the person will not choose them, but will rather come and choose me. Once Barry or Dizzy realizes that I have reduced my price, they would also immediately start reducing their prices so people can go and buy them. But if you read textbook economics, it doesn't teach us that. It rather tells us that you must increase the price so that demand and supply would reach an equilibrium. You must reduce supply. And by doing so, the price of the commodity must be increased so that you reach an equilibrium. That is what textbook economics teaches you. But that is not what the reality teaches you. In effect, the reality will tell you that when commodities are scarce in the market, what it will rather cost, okay, when commodities are scarce, what it will rather cost are hoarding of goods. And when goods are hoarded, people are going to increase their prices because you cannot buy it anywhere but come to them to buy. So when goods are scarce in the market, you would have to definitely increase your prices. Because no matter how you increase it, people will come and buy. Because it suffers what we call elasticity of demand. So that is textbook. Textbook economics is totally different from the reality on grounds. But Baumia thought that what he and I had learned in the economics class was what we're going to use to rule this country. And so when he comes and he becomes vice president, at the first cabinet meeting, he will take economics textbook there. 
and he will read page one and tell Akufuado, let us do this. He will read page two and tell Akufuado, let us do this. Then, because Akufuado too is bereft of economic ideas, anything Alaji Bahamia was telling him, he was agreeing to it. Then by the time they realized, the whole economy had tilted and was going towards, <laughs> was going towards a dam, to, to capsize into a dam. Then Akufuado realized that, hey, the economy is going to follow. The dollar is rising. For the cost of living is high. So let me form a, a, a committee to come and help Baumia because at this point, Baumia's textbook is not working again. You remember in 2019, President Akufuado set up what we call the FX committee. He set up a committee and said they were going to stabilize the city. Many of you don't know, have not heard of the committee again. Yes, the committee themselves had to run away. The dollar had to chase all of them away. And they ran one by one, one by one. And that is how Kamala Chamante had to jump out of the boat. A free Akuto abandoned his ministry and ran away. Look, many of them had to run for their lives because the economy was now powerful than them. And to them, they were now looking at the economy as some very, very wild animal that was coming at them. And they virtually had no hope and they had no interest in even managing or stabilizing the economy of this country again. So they had to flee. And the, the dollar now had bull chest. The dollar had jammed and was now strong. And today, the dollar walks and faces every Ghanaian like it doesn't even fear us again. When you take your CDs, the dollar can decide to change it at 16 CD. It can decide to change it at 15 CD. Just say, when it's morning and the dollar wakes up, the rate at which the dollar wants itself to be changed is what it tells us to come and change it for. And we have no option. Because the man who was given the key to even take care of the dollar has abandoned the key and has run, uh, left, fled, held a skelter for his life. Baumia has also abandoned it and was last seen looking for a car home use Opel Vectra Steer to drive. And virtually everything is in, a, is in a limbo. On the issue of corruption, you see, anytime I come to corruption, I feel passionate because corruption is what is virtually killing the youth of this country. If the monies that we have lost in corruption were to be used in investments, I tell you that we would have solved all the problems I've stated here halfway. But you see, when you have greedy people, you have wicked, selfish, and very insensitive leaders at the helm of affairs, they rather think of their pockets, and they think of themselves, and they don't care about the youthful generation out there. Look, the only thing Alaji Baumia learned very well from Akufuado is how to siphon state funds and how to be corrupt. And you see, at the point, Akufuado at the point started testing him to see whether he has really learned on the job. And any time he tested him, it went through, but the Ghanaian people were smarter. If you remember, one of the first corruptions Akufuado did was exposed by Nyantechi in announced number 12. When Akufuado came, apart from his daughter attempting to steal Petro from, from Bost, and that was in the moving Pina scandal, where she created a company that, I mean, virtually... Uh, 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 knew nothing about uh, uh, petrol sector, uh, the, the energy sector of this country, just to go and siphon funds. The Ghanaian people shut it down. And Akufuado said, if you think you are smart, I will be smarter than you people. So he contracted Nyantechi, who was his very best friend, and was also a president like him, because he was the president of the Ghana Football Association. Then Nyantechi went out and started lobbying businessmen to come and then uh, deal with Akufuado. Nyantechi brought businessmen to the extent that at every point in time, he could predict even where Akufuado was sitting in his room. If you watch Adas number 12, he was telling the man that when you enter the room at the corner, there's a chair there. That is where the man will be sitting. When you go, don't talk too much. Just put three million on the table. I can assure you that when you put three million, the next morning, Akufuado himself will look for my packet and enter because he will know that if I can bring three million, I can bring more again in the future. Then he said, when we go back to Ghana, we'll meet Baumia. As for Baumia, he is so hungry to the extent that just find two million and come don't give him three million because he's not the boss the boss himself who had sold family lands and his brothers had sold all their father's houses just to make him president if you remember announced number 12 <coughs> auntie, she said this who had sold all their lands was looking for big money so let's give him three million when we give baumia two million as for baumia he will shake their head like a lizard ah, all the bridges and everything in this country will be for us. And you can mark my words. Anytime you need a contract, I'll give you. Then he said, when you go and meet the uh, trans the roads minister, 
As for him, let's just find one million for him. The surprising thing was that when Yanteji finished, he didn't forget of himself. Bro. He said, me too, I'll go. So me too, just find one million and, and let me put it in my pocket because I've done well. At least it's not easy to carry a president in my pocket. If the pres if the dress, yes, I'll have to sew new dresses and wear and keep putting him in my pocket. So that was how that corruption scandal came up. Till date, no investigation was done about it. It was referred to the CID. The CID called Nyantechi one, two, three times. And they abandoned the matter because President Kufado said uh, they cannot investigate him and he will not allow them to investigate Nyantechi because uh, the monies Nyantechi has done a good job by bringing monies and nobody should fault him. He was smart. Then came the Ameri scandal. So when Akufado wanted to test how smart and how corrupt Baumia can be, he gave him the Ameri deal. On the day where Ameri deal was being signed, that was the 31st of July, 2018, Akufado had traveled to an ECOWAS meeting. That was when they were to elect a new ECOWAS chairman. Uh, the Ameri deal and parliament was supposed to rise on the 31st, that same day. Akufado wasn't available. So Akufado called Baumia and said, look, you, you have been learning fast, but I haven't tested you before. Let me test you and see the magic you can also perform in corruption. So they gave the documents to Baumia. Baumia just looked at the 510 million. He just cancelled it at once and increased it to 1.3 billion. He said, I have inflated it, go and pass at parliament. When he got to parliament, the MP said, my friend, you cannot bring this 1.3 billion and expect us to pass it. Explain to us how a married that was supposed to be paid for one 510 million be, 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 be increased to this 1.3 uh, uh, three, three, three billion. Explain to us. Then immediately parliament roasted it and they threw the papers away. Then Akufado called Baumia and said, ah, but you, pa, I thought you were 10, I thought you were sharp. Now you are not sharp. <laughs> You've made them catch us. So Akufado had to fly back into the country. And then, you know, for Baumia, anything you teach him, he cannot learn. He can't learn the economy. He can't learn corruption well. Anything, he, he would definitely let them catch it, even though he has the taste and the penchant to steal or to siphon funds. But